Today at the National Press Club, Shadow Treasurer Jim Chalmers. The Labor frontbencher will deliver his post-budget reply address, outlining Labor's vision for the economy and the country just weeks before a federal election. Jim Chalmers with today's National Press Club address. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the National Press Club, coming to you today from the uh, Great Hall of Parliament House and the Westpac Address. My name is Laura Tingle. I'm the club's president. Last week, we heard a budget sales pitch from Treasurer Josh Frydenberg. He and the Prime Minister want the political debate to be about economic management. But it seems we aren't actually having a debate about economic management. The budget papers shared a yawning gap, showed a yawning gap between spending and revenue for the next decade, and the Treasurer didn't really have an answer to how that would be closed beyond growth. Let's see if the Shadow Treasurer can do better today. Please welcome Jim Chalmers. Well, thanks very much, Laura. Thanks, Morris. Thanks, the sponsors and directors of the Press Club uh, for this opportunity to speak to the Press Club for the fourth time uh, this parliamentary term. Uh, for the first, but hopefully not the last time, uh, in this grand and auspicious Great Hall. Uh, Recognising that the history of this place is just a tiny speck on tens of thousands of years of the world's oldest continuous culture. Acknowledging the customs, elders and traditions of the Ngunnawal and the Ngambri people and all the First Nations. And proud that an Albanese Labor government will implement the Uluru Statement from the heart in full. Now Anthony will be joining us shortly and I'm grateful, for, I'm grateful that he is, but also I'm especially grateful that he has given me the opportunity to work with a really outstanding group of colleagues in our economic team. And I wanted to acknowledge in particular Katie Gallagher, who's here, uh, and also, that's right, and also outstanding colleagues and friends like Stephen Jones and Matt Thistlethwaite and Andrew Lee, who make up our economic team. And also to work with other colleagues in the Shadow Cabinet and in the Parliament who have joined us here today. Penny Wong, Michelle Rowland, Brendan O'Connor, Christina Keneally, Raf Ciccone, Marielle Smith, Louise Pratt, Christy McBain, Sue Lyons, Daniel Molino, David Smith, Alicia Payne. Uh, thank you so much. What a great squad for joining us uh, today. I really appreciate it. And also great leaders, outstanding leaders in our federation, uh, like Andrew Barr, the treasurer uh, of the ACT, also the chief minister of the ACT. Uh, and I know that you've got Mally here tomorrow as well, which is going to be a really terrific opportunity uh, to speak to him uh, as well. Uh, and in thanking uh, all of my team here today as well, uh, and my team in Logan Central at home and here in Canberra, uh, can, I, can you just indulge me for a moment as I say how delighted I am uh, that Barb Peeney is with us here today. Now, yeah. So Barb has worked for Labor frontbenchers for 35 years, uh, but hasn't been to one of these for about 20 years. Uh, so I'm really pleased that Barb has joined us. On your Barb. Now, on the face of it, the frantic last few days before an election's called might not seem an ideal time to take a step back for a moment, to take stock of our economy, our country, or our future. But with so much at stake, I think it's the perfect time because we have learned so much about ourselves. We've learned from the mediocrity we had before the pandemic, the catastrophe we had during it, and the uncertainty that we're experiencing now. From floods and fire, a pandemic, a war in Europe, before that from the first recession in 30 years and another deep and damaging downturn just last year. From the false starts and the false dawns of this recovery, marred by policy mistakes and missteps. From a nation which rose to the occasion each time it needed to, and a government that fell back into old habits. A people who were there for each other at every single turn, and a Prime Minister who went missing, taking credit, but never taking responsibility. And now, after nine long years, three Treasurers and three Prime Ministers, the verdict is in. Average economic growth at 2.3% under this Liberal National Government each year, 
lower than the 2.5% of the last Labor government. Average productivity growth at 1.1% a year under them versus 1.4% under us. Average wage growth, 2.1% a year under this, under this government, but 3.6% under us. Average business investment, negative 2.8% a year compared with 5.5% under Labor. Average unemployment at 5.7% under this government versus 5.1% under its Labor predecessor. Multiplying debt and deficits as far as the eye can see. Fact after fact after fact, speaking to this one disappointing truth. This has been a wasted decade of missed opportunities, of families falling further and further behind, weighed down by skyrocketing costs of living and falling real wages. And now, not even a recovering economy or a recovering budget or high commodity prices, an unemployment rate falling in welcome ways, not even the skill shortages that come along with that have brought decent wages growth. And shouting louder and louder at Australians about how great they've got it and how grateful they should be doesn't actually make it true. So if the looming election meant that the budget couldn't be an act of contrition, it should have at least been an act of recognition. Not just recognition of today's pressures, but recognition that those pressures existed well before the pandemic. An act of understanding that we can't have a better future if we double down and double back on the failed policies of the recent past. An acknowledgement that nine years of waste and rorts in the budget and mismanagement of the economy have delivered the worst wages growth of any government ever, the weakest business investment and productivity outcomes of the last 30 years, the worst set of books ever presented to the people at an election, a budget riddled with rorts and chock full of wasteful spending, a treasurer personally culpable for tens of billions of dollars of emergency support for businesses which didn't need it. Another five and a half billion dollars wasted on subs that will never be built. Sports rorts, car park rorts, dodgy land deals, the list goes on. And when Josh Frydenberg said from this lectern six days ago that his main focus was on winning the election and when Scott Morrison talks about the budget being a shield, they gave the game away. This was a budget designed to shield a government from the people. All about setting the coalition up for a fourth term, not setting our country up for a better future. That's why it's a budget unworthy of the Australian people, the sacrifices they've made and the struggles that we've endured. A budget unfit for the scale and the scope and the severity of the challenges our country and our world are grappling with. Australians deserve so much better and the challenges of the moment demanded so much more. Because at their best, budgets bind together a government's agenda and they lay the foundations for the future. They should be the how in the story, the clear and compelling proof of how a party's promises and plans will matter for real people. A budget should embrace the big task of finding a place for everyone in the unfolding story of national economic success. Think of it this way. This huge tapestry over here that Arthur Boyd produced for this room is not a traditional landscape. It's a close-up of bushland. And apparently the impression that he wanted to leave was of a story in the middle of its telling. A story of vivid detail, clear and creative direction, but a destination not ever finally reached. No rest, no end. And governing is a bit like that as well. We should always be in the middle of the story, by which I mean we should be prepared to embark on new initiatives, knowing we may not be around to take credit for their success. That's the weight of responsibility and the generational perspective that a budget should carry. And that's the approach I want to take as Treasurer. Instead, last week we got a document that gloried in its shallowness and wallowed in its triviality. Deliberately, overtly, insultingly conceived as a prop for the election. And celebrated by the Liberals and Nationals not for what it would do for the country, 
but just for giving them something to say in their ads. Last week's budget showed exactly what sort of campaign Scott Morrison and Josh Frydenberg will run. Glib, incoherent, in denial of reality, and completely silent on the future. No ambition beyond their own survival. No vision beyond election night. And we have to expect more than that from government. If last week had seen a Labor budget handed down, it would have offered hope and support and resources to communities cleaning up floodwaters and rebuilding after bushfires. It would have delivered a plan for cheaper childcare and stronger wages growth, easing families off that punishing treadmill of rising prices and flatlining pay. It would have invested in Australian skills and small businesses and local supply chains to grow our self-reliance and our resilience and make our future here in Australia. It would, have, it would have put an end to nine years of stupendous rorts, abuse and waste and funded and waste and funded a national anti-corruption commission. It would have invested in productivity so we can grow the economy more strongly without runaway inflation. And as Anthony made clear, in a way that we're all incredibly proud of, a Labor budget and a Labor government would fix the crisis in aged care. Now this is the least we can do for older Australians and the workers who care for them. Because through everything the world has thrown at Australia over the past few years, our people have shown their best qualities. But this, government, this budget showcases the government's worst instincts. Self-obsessed, short-term and out of touch with reality. A $103.6 billion improvement in the budget, concert, courtesy of commodity prices and automatic stabilisers, but still $1.169 trillion worth of generational debt without a generational dividend. Another promise of wages growth, hoping that people would forget they've been wrong 52 of the other 55 times they've forecasted. Now we know that prices for essentials like petrol, rent, and childcare were already skyrocketing even before Russia invaded Ukraine, while Australians' real wages were going backwards. And we understand, of course, the invasion exacerbates this, and it feeds into global investor uncertainty, which had only just begun to recover in the aftermath of the pandemic and the recession. We recognise geopolitical risks aren't just rising in Europe, but closer to home as well. And as we consider the implications for our national security and for our economy from a Chinese leadership which is becoming not just more assertive in tone, but more aggressive in posture. And just the other day, factory activity in China slumped at its sharpest pace in two years, reminding us that the global health uncertainty from the pandemic is, still isn't over. We've all heard the Reserve Bank Governor warn that interest rates will rise before long, no matter who wins the election, driving up the costs of borrowing for families, businesses and governments. Now the wrong and risky response to this uncertainty, to this context and this backdrop, is to continue on the current course and cling to the status quo. The most damaging thing that Australia could do right now, the biggest economic and social harm we could inflict, would be to accept flatlining wages, soaring prices, tepid investment and weak growth as our best case scenario, our new normal. That's not stability. That's stagnation. Now the warnings have been there and they've been ignored for some time. Australians have already paid too much for this complacency. From a lack of disaster mitigation to a bungled vaccine rollout and a rapid testing debacle which emptied our supermarkets. Cost of living pressures haven't just shown up out of the blue. They aren't just a consequence of Russia invading Ukraine, they're a consequence of the coalition attacking wages and job security. That's why the relief in this budget isn't even enough to make up for the more than $3,200 fall in real wages for the average worker these past two years. But of all the failures in this budget, all the drift and disappointment of the eight before it, the most glaring omission by far is the future. Again, the warnings were plain for all to see, this time in the government's own intergenerational report. It said if we do nothing to arrest our decline, we face an economy that's smaller than expected, growing slower than before, and saddled with at least four more decades of debt and deficits. And that's before 
we even factor in lower productivity growth at the average of the most recent cycle under the coalition. In that more realistic case, the economy would be almost 10% smaller by 2060, and Australians would be $32,000 worse off each on average. In the budget over the same time frame, the deficit would be 2.2 percentage points bigger, and net debt would be 22.7 percentage points higher than the substantial debt and deficits forecast already. So Australians can't afford this complacency that's characterised the Liberal and National approach to the economy now for the best part of a decade. And that's why we've said, if we are successful at the election, we'll hand down a proper budget this year. One which will implement our commitments, put in place our economic strategy, and begin the hard work of dealing with a legacy of wasteful and rorted spending. And today, in giving you a sense of that, you'll see what the first half of a first term in my portfolio might look like if we're successful. The economic strategy, the fiscal strategy, that will run alongside our white paper on the labour market and our review of the Reserve Bank and the intersection of fiscal and monetary policy. But one belief unites our whole approach. That's that, a, that an economy and a society stronger after COVID than before is within our reach. Our plan for economic growth invests in the future, targets cost of living pressures and supports sectors that will improve our lives create more secure new jobs and grow our economy. Each of our investments are designed for a generational dividend and not just a six to seven week political payoff. Instead of a panicked political pamphlet, we offer a plan and it's got five parts. A powering Australia policy to get energy costs and emissions down as we transition to new sources of cleaner energy. Hundreds of thousands of fee-free TAFE places to address the skill shortages acting as a handbrake on our economy. Cheaper, more accessible childcare to build a bigger workforce, able to work more and earn more if people choose to. More modern infrastructure, including key investments in upgrading the MBN and the digital economy. And a future made in Australia, made possible by smart co-investments in crucial sectors like manufacturing and the care economy and boosting the resilience of small business. Now this five point plan will lift the productive capacity of the economy and lift the speed limits on growth without adding unnecessarily to inflationary pressures. It will help create the more secure work and the stronger wages growth that we need by training people for higher, op higher wage opportunities, making it easier for mums and dads to go back to work and by ensuring we're dealing with issues around labour hire, the gig economy and casualisation which have undermined wages now for too long. So much of what we propose will deliver more than one benefit to our economy, to its workers, families and employers as well. For example, investing in cleaner and cheaper energy will cut emissions, but it will also cut power bills by $270, $75 a year by 2025, unlock $76 billion of investment and create over 600,000 jobs, most of these in the regions. Fee-free TAFE and more university places will equip Australians with critical skills, and that'll go some way to addri addressing those crippling shortages which are holding so many Australian businesses back. The TAFEs and universities add billions to the economy each year, but they also help Australians take advantage of the best opportunities. For example, Deloitte has recently found average digital skills are attracting a wage premium of around 9%, equivalent to an extra $7,700 per worker every year. Upgrading the MBN could help us capture a digital opportunity which Alpha Beta has estimated could be worth $207 billion in GDP per year by 2030 if Australia caught up to global leaders. But it will also make it easier for Australians to decide how they work and where they work from in the post-pandemic economy. A future made in Australia with procurement and co-investment plans We'll create new jobs and revitalise our regions with new industries and more opportunities in more parts of Australia. But it will also help shore up our supply chains and make them more resilient. Cheaper childcare will boost GDP from higher participation by at least three times as much as the government's alternative. But it's also great for kids. It helps alleviate cost pressures on working parents. And our aged care policy is all about doing the right thing for older Australians and those who care for them. But again, there's an economic dividend that flows from investment in such a big part of the care economy. 
Last year, after, steady growth, after the steady growth of the past decade, the health and social assistance sector made the second biggest contribution to GDP of any industry. Ten years ago, it wasn't even in the top five. And when it comes to aged care specifically, the sector employs close to 400,000 Australians, generates tens of billions of dollars in wages paid, in total revenue, and in GDP value added every year. So the point I'm making is that each element of our plan reinforces another. Our policies were designed and developed together, and they work together as a coherent strategy in pursuit of clear objectives. That's the product of 103 hours so far of careful, considered deliberations of our Shadow Expenditure Review Committee this term. And it's what bang for buck looks like. Instead, in the budget, we get cash shoveled in the general direction of voters in that the hope that they'll forget a decade of flatlining living standards from the most wasteful government since Federation. And to paraphrase another Queenslander, I say this to Scott Morrison and Josh Frydenberg. This reckless rorting and wasteful spending must stop. If it's not the time to flick the switch to austerity, it is the time to flick a switch to quality, to smart investments in our future. Because the best way to repair the budget is to get the economy growing in a broader, more sustainable, more inclusive way. Now contrast the bleak picture from the intergenerational report with the opportunities before us if we choose the right path. PwC has estimated with growth just 0.5% higher per year than what is currently projected, the structural deficit will close and would reach zero net debt 15 years earlier than currently anticipated. And that's why we want to be judged on the quality of our spending to the extent that it delivers the right kind of growth. We will be investing where it counts to create more opportunities, unlock business investment and drive productivity. This has never been more important than right now where we know that our economic pressures lie on the supply side. That's why the quality of spending matters as much as the quantity. We are acutely aware of rate hike risks and what this means for household and federal budgets. The Commonwealth Bank's latest forecasts are that a cash rate of around 2.5% in line with market pricing will push mortgage payments as a share of household disposable income to a record high. This reflects the worsening housing affordability under the Liberals and the record household debt to income ratio, which has increased by 20 percentage points after remaining stable during Labor's last term. We know that rising mortgages are bound to impact the recovery and the comfort of households in deploying that $250 billion worth of savings on their balance sheets. So we take these risks seriously. But when you take two of our largest budget commitments so far in childcare and aged care, together they make up only one-fifth of the government's new spending decisions that they unveiled in their latest budget. To put that into context, by 2025-26, our biggest commitments will make up only 0.3% of GDP spread over the next four years. In comparison, the government's decisions in this year alone are larger at 0.4% of GDP and represent around 1.5% of GDP over the forward estimates. So we maintain that our approach is necessary and responsible and right for the economic conditions. And so is our fiscal strategy grow the economy the right way, focus on quality and bang for buck, end the rorts and waste, and work with other countries to make sure that multinationals pay their fair share of tax in Australia where they make their profits. And when it comes to value for money, it's hard to think of a better investment than in aged care. And for those of you who've been tempted to write of the blurred differences between the major parties, I offer you this as an example of one of the defining distinctions between the big parties. It's been disappointing but not really surprising to see the lengths this government will go to to deny people decent care, decent food and decent wages. And I know they think they're on a winner when they talk about the price that we are willing to pay for tangible improvements in the lives of older Australians and the working lives of those who care for them. But obviously, our, firstly, our plan is fully costed. But secondly, do they actually hear themselves when they ask these questions? When they say that $2.5 billion is too high a price to pay to spare older Australians from neglect and abuse and starvation? 
And even if somehow you could put that moral calculation aside, every time we're asked how we'll pay for important investments in our economy, such as childcare or aged care, remember this. The government just spent $39 billion in a budget without offsetting it. They talk about temporary spending, but they've opened up a structural deficit that will see something like 0.7% of GDP in 2032-33. They committed to $70 billion in spending between the December mid-year budget update and the March budget alone in three months. They wasted $5.5 billion on submarines that will never be built, more than twice the cost of our aged care plan. They've wasted at least $30 billion on other rorts, around 12 times the amount we propose to invest in extra support for aged care. So the election campaign that officially begins in a few days is an opportunity for a proper national conversation about all of these issues that I've touched on today. And I repeat my challenge to Josh Frydenberg to debate the budget and the economy and the future at least three times in this campaign, here, in the West, anywhere that we can make it happen. He shouldn't hide behind scare campaigns or dishonest paid advertising or try to fight the 2019 election all over again. The campaign needs to be better than that. Because before Australians choose what kind of government they want, we first need to choose what kind of campaign we want. And when the Prime Minister spoke to you here in January, he said it wouldn't be a referendum, it would be a choice. But we know that it's both. A referendum on the past 10 years, which sifts through the rubble of the government's economic credibility and the shards of the Prime Minister's glass jaw and a choice to be made about the next 10 years. The campaign to frame that decision can be a battle of one-liners or it can be a contest of substance. It can be spin and marketing or it can be real talk about what's confronting this country and what's at stake. Now, most of us in this room have roles to play in that. But in the end, what we say, how or whether you cover it, what you write or produce is only one part of the big, shifting, sprawling conversation that every election represents. At a national and a local level, for communities and for individuals, a whole host of complexities will decide who Australians choose to govern them. And we know that whoever wins government on the 14th or the 21st of May, that when Australians wake up on the morning of the 15th or the 22nd, real wages will be going backwards. Businesses will be short of staff industries short of skills. Childcare fees and healthcare costs will be too high for too many people. There will be conflict and tension in the world far away and closer to home. Our country will occupy a precarious place in global supply chains. There will be a trillion dollars in debt and not enough to show for it. Petrol prices and interest rates will be about to rise again no matter who wins. A long rebuild ahead in places like Lismore and beyond. But what I also know is that if people wake up with a new Labor government, then for the first time in nine years, there'll be a Prime Minister, a Treasurer, a Cabinet and a government with a determination and resolve and a sense of responsibility to actually start dealing with these challenges. And there will be a government that has the plans for a better future, for a stronger, more resilient, more inclusive, more sustainable economy that creates opportunities and puts those opportunities within the reach of more people. Because we want to run this country, its economy, in the interests of its people. A people who are like Arthur Boyd's tapestry in the middle of our story. The election will be tough and it will be close. And the path beyond that is challenging too. So we're not here to muck around or muddle through. A better future depends on it. Thanks very much, and I look forward to your questions. Well, thanks very much, Jim. Um, you described the uh, budget last week in various terms as one unworthy of the Australian people. Uh, glor glor gloried in its shallowness, wallowed in its triviality, Glib, incoherent, in denial of reality. Uh, blah 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 blah. Not, not, Keep you, going, Laura. I'm not, a, not a great fan. Uh, but Labor just waved it through. Uh, the big question, as you say, is 
what happens next, and you know, it wasn't, and you say it's not a budget for the future. The budget is uh, forecasting a big gap between spending and revenue for 10 years now. You seem to be saying, as the Treasurer is saying, that that will be closed by growth, with the only difference being that you're going to have some slightly better quality spending promises. Are you, have you got any new set of fiscal rules about the size of revenue, the size of spending, and how you'll be working out your budget strategy? Yeah. Well, thanks, Laura. I mean, first of all, you, know, you judge budgets not just by what's in them, but what's not in them. And our criticism of the budget is that it has a shelf life of six or seven weeks. And so the absence, obviously, is the plans beyond that for the future. You know, if you want to go to the specifics of uh, budget repair, uh, you know, there's a, there's a heap of spending, a heap of cash handouts in the very near term. Uh, there's not much budget repair beyond that except for those $3 billion that the Prime Minister wants, doesn't want to talk about in terms of the, the secret cuts on page 49 of budget paper too. Right? And so there is, I think, a gap when it comes to budget repair in the future from the government. Now, we've said uh, that there are at least four ways uh, that you can improve the budget. Uh, the quantity of the debt matters to us, but the quality of the spending, I genuinely believe, matters as much, if not more. Uh, and when we sit around, Katie and I, with our shadow expenditure review colleagues, you know, what we're really looking for, yes, we're looking for ways to make the budget more sustainable, but mostly we're, making, we're looking for ways to make the budget deliver a measurable economic improvement. Uh, and so when it comes, so that is a key part of it. We shouldn't lightly dismiss that part of our fiscal strategy, but there are three other parts as well. Uh, there is a task uh, to deal with the stupendous waste and rorts that we've seen in the budget. You know, discretionary fund after discretionary fund allocated by color-coded spreadsheet, that is a problem in the budget because every dollar wasted in that fashion is a dollar you can't invest in the economy or you can't provide support for people doing it tough. Uh, there is an opportunity uh, to uh, reorient the budget, as we would like to get the opportunity to do before the end of the year, uh, uh, into more quality uh, investments. Uh, and there is an opportunity uh, to do something meaningful about multinational taxes. There's a big global movement on at the moment. Now, all the countries with which we compare ourselves, they want to work with us on making sure that multinationals pay their fair share of tax where they make their profits. Uh, and that will level the playing field for Australian businesses as well. Uh, so there is at least four ways uh, that we would go about improving the budget. Uh, and frankly, uh, when you compare it to what's gone before us for the best part of the last decade, um, uh, you know, even just doing something about the politically motivated wa ra waste and rotting in the budget would make a difference. Next question is from Pablo Vinales. Pablo Vinales, SPS World News. Mr Chalmers, part of the criticism from your opponent has been a lack of experience in the Treasury portfolio, um, such a pivotal role in such an uncertain time. So I'm curious, given your involvement in the handling of the GFC, what were the lessons learned? What mistakes were made? And can you assure voters that those mistakes won't be repeated should you win the election? Yeah, of course I can. You know, one of the reasons why I'm proud of my experience, I'm proud of Anthony's experience, our whole shadow cabinet. We've got this terrific mix of people who've been around for a while, we've got newer um, people who've been in the shadow cabinet for a shorter period, we've got the right mix between experience and generational change. And that, I think, is a, an accurate description of our team. Uh, in terms of my own experience, I mean, if Josh Frydenberg's main critique of me is that I hadn't, haven't handed down a budget before I've handed down a budget, well, that applies to him too. And by the way, it applies to Peter Costello. It applies to Paul Keating. It applies to a whole heap of others. Uh, so I, I don't, frankly, I don't pay much attention to that. Uh, I have a heap of experience in the economic portfolio. That lockup that I did the other day was my 16th. Uh, I don't think anyone in the parliament's done more than that. I could, could be corrected, but I wouldn't have thought so. Uh, my defining experience is putting budgets together during the global financial crisis. I would have thought most objective observers would have thought that's pretty handy. And yes, there are lessons to be learned from that. Uh, of course, there's lessons to be learned at every turn. Uh, and I'd like to think that I've learned them. The other thing which I find uh, extraordinary uh, is when the Prime Minister opens up a similar critique of Anthony. And what it reveals is uh, that they think that holding the infrastructure portfolio and being the Deputy Prime Minister of Australia is not relevant to our economy. 
which is a bizarre concession that they don't see infrastructure as key to economic growth in our economy. Now, I sat around the ERC table with Anthony, with Penny, with others who are here, uh, and I saw the work that has gone in and the experience that we gained in that period and subsequently, and I'm confident uh, that the experience that we stack up against these characters will see Australia in a good place. Can you name the mistakes, though? Beg your pardon? Can you name the mistakes made? No. <laughs> <laughs> Look clearly, look clearly, uh, sorry, Pat, I was just kidding. Look clearly, um, you know, we're not, we're, not, we're not looking for a rerun. You know, we're not, you know, when we sit down and work out what the best agenda is for the future and for the economy, you know, we're not looking to retrace steps. You know, we're looking to do the right thing for the conditions that we inherit. And inevitably, when you do that, you learn from all of your past experiences, good and bad. Phil Curry. Thanks, Laura. Um, uh, Dr Chalmers, just, I want to go back to Laura's question because in terms of fiscal rules, we're five minutes to an election and all we know from the Labor Party on, on its economic plans is we're going to get bang for our buck. I wonder if I could just sort of maybe try and pin you down on a couple of things more specific. Are you going to take a tax cap to the election? The Coalition has a 23.9% tax to GDP ratio. Are you going to be governed by a ratio of your own? And you were critical in your speech of the structural deficit hitting 0.7% of GDP by the end of the medium term, coming down from about 3% now. Are you going to try and do better? Are you going to aim for a surplus by the end of the medium term? Or can you give us any guidelines as to what, you know, what's going to be governing your fiscal strategy between now and uh, the election and not after the election? Yeah, thanks very much, Phil. Whether it's the budget on Tuesday night or whether it's the intergenerational report, I think it's made it really clear uh, that it would be hard to anticipate, anticipate surpluses uh, for some time. You know, that's just the condition of the budget that we would inherit. Uh, when it comes to our fiscal strategy, you shouldn't lightly dismiss getting some value for money. I mean, the absence of that's been a big part of not having enough to show for a trillion dollars in debt the last decade or so. Uh, we're not attracted to the government's tax cap. Uh, and the reason we're not attracted to it is because it seems to us like quite an arbitrary cap imposed for political reasons rather than good economic reasons. And clearly, as the economic conditions evolve, we take advice from the Treasury and from elsewhere uh, about the most appropriate settings. But I think we've said really for some time now uh, that the, the arbitrary um, uh, tax cap that the government has imposed, which the government doesn't hit, by the way, in the forwards uh, from memory, uh, is something that they say uh, to try and have a political argument rather than to try and generate a genuine economic outcome. Michelle Grattan. Michelle Grattan from The Conversation. Dr Chalmers, the uh, Reserve Bank faces a character forming few months ahead, whichever side of politics wins the election, making judgments about interest rates and also an inquiry which is supported by you and by the government. Could you say why this inquiry is necessary, given some experts think it is not? And would you invite the Governor of the Reserve Bank to have another term when his term expires next year? And if I can add a third prong, but one question, do you think that the next Governor of the Reserve Bank, whenever that comes, should be a woman? Yeah, th thanks very much, Michelle. Um, I I'm not going to foreshadow a decision on the Governor of the Reserve Bank. Um, I made my views very clear on the Deputy Governor that there was an opportunity uh, to promote uh, a woman into more senior ranks of the bank, and I'm pleased, frankly, uh, that that happened. Uh, but I'm not going to make a... I'm not going to preempt the decision about Governor Lowe. I will say this, though. Um, I think Governor Lowe uh, is uh, a fine Reserve Bank Governor. We've been very fortunate in this country to have a succession of very good governors of the Reserve Bank. Uh, I've worked closely now with two of them, Glenn Stevens and Phil Lowe. And I have a mountain of respect for Phil Lowe. Uh, and he knows, and I think you know, uh, that our plan to have a review of the Reserve Bank uh, is not designed as some kind of uh, anti-bank or anti-fill um, uh, interrogation. 
it's going to be, if we get the chance, a genuine opportunity to work out, okay, we've, since we had the last review of the Reserve Bank, we've had normal times, we've had two sets of difficult times, we've had extraordinary monetary policy, and we've had this big question which has never seems to be sufficiently answered in a thoughtful, considered way about the interaction of fiscal, mon fiscal and monetary policy. And so I see the review that way. And I would like to work closely with the Governor of the Reserve Bank uh, and others who have an interest in this to make sure that we get it right. And that's why I want to have that review. Jim Beglati. <coughs> Jim Beshwati from Seven News. You've committed to handing down a budget later this year if you win government. You've also acknowledged that the cost of living crisis will continue for many months. So I ask you, if things do stay bad or get worse, will you commit to provide immediate cost of living relief in your budget, which includes cash handouts? Yeah, thanks, Jen. Look, we'll play the cards we're dealt. Uh, we've said that it's hard to imagine a world where uh, the uh, cash handouts in the current budget continue indefinitely. You know, that's just being upfront about uh, the pressures in the budget. You know, I've been asked probably 20 or 30 times in six days about you know, what we might do with petrol excise, what we might do with some of these other um, uh, bits of support for, for people. Uh, and I'm just trying to be upfront and say it won't continue forever. Having said that, you know, clearly, if we're putting a budget together whenever it might be on the advice of Treasury, uh, clearly we'll play the cards that we're dealt. Uh, and if there's a need for more support, clearly we would look at that. Uh, but our starting point is uh, that the support that passed through this parliament uh, in the middle of last week is temporary. Uh, if there are other measures we need to look at, we will. But also say this, um, even before last week's budget, you know, when and before Russia, Ukraine, and the government was pretending that everything was fine, even though real wages were falling and people were facing skyrocketing cost of living. We already had cost of living policies out there. You know, our biggest on budget commitment in our alternative budget at the moment is childcare, getting childcare costs down, making a big difference to um, uh, cost of living for working families. We've got a, uh, an energy policy which is all about bringing power bills down. Uh, we've got a policy about getting real wages growing again. So, uh, it's, so I think even if the current support runs out, if and when it runs out, uh, we have enduring ways to support working families through tough times. Can I just confirm, sorry, so if you need to extend the fuel, the reduction to the fuel excise, you will? Look, our starting point is that it ends. Uh, if there is a, you know, an incredibly compelling reason to leave it in, uh, we would consider that. But to be upfront with Australians, uh, no matter who wins government in May, uh, it is likely uh, that that petrol price relief will end. Rachel Baxter. Thanks so much, Rachel Baxter from Channel 9. So the aged care reform has obviously been the grand centrepiece of last week's budget reply, but Mark Dreyfus has admitted that there may not be enough trained nurses to implement the plan and have a registered nurse on duty 24-7 in every aged care facility. You're the treasurer. Have you calculated how many nurses will be needed, how much this will cost, and how long it will take? Yeah, um, thank you for that. Look, we do need more nurses. And one of the reasons why we've got uh, a big substantial training policy and a big substantial universities policy is because where there are areas of substantial skills shortages, we need to deal with that. And that's one reason why one of our, you know, our biggest emphases, our biggest commitments, has been around uh, skills training. Uh, so I think that's, that's self-evident. Um, we will need to train more people. Our policy does not come in the day after the election. There's a bit of time, a little bit of time to ramp up to it. Um, but our intention is to train more nurses and to fill this gap. How many more though, sorry? And you said in your speech as well that the plan is fully costed. How much will it cost for these nurses? Uh, well, our plan is $2.5 billion. We've costed that. We've put the po policy out there and the costing out there. We'll need tens of thousands of nurses. Uh, I mean, that's pretty clear. When you want to put more nurses into aged care, uh, you need to train them for that task, and that's what we intend to do. Sarah Martin. 
Hello, Sarah Martin from The Guardian. Um, just back to questions that both Laura and Phil have tried to ask you about in terms of fiscal consolidation. Um, you've, you've been very critical of the, government, of the budget for being chock full of wasteful spending. Can you identify spending in, over the forward estimates um, or over the medium term that you won't go ahead with and what sort of saving that would give to the budget? And you've obviously been very critical of discretionary grant spending. Why not abolish those discretionary grants altogether? Yeah, thanks, Sarah. The, I'll take them in reverse order. Uh, your last question. Um, we think that there is an opportunity uh, to trim some of the discretionary funds, but it's difficult from opposition without full visibility. One of the reasons we have estimates and other uh, opportunities is because there's not a lot of visibility on what the government has committed to those funds uh, or where some of that money is going to. So that is a process that we intend to engage in. Uh, on the other issue about an example of spending that the government does that we wouldn't do, I think there's a really clear example. You know, the, the government, because they had for so long this arbitrary staffing cap on the public service, meant that so much, uh, so many billions of dollars uh, we were being spent on labour hire and contractors and consultants in areas traditionally performed by the APS. Uh, and, you know, I'm, I spent a lot of time uh, with uh, the accounting firms and the consulting firms, and they do first-class work, and nobody's saying that we end that. Uh, but there is an opportunity, I think, uh, to have a good look at the spending that goes into that part of the budget, to work out whether we could do more with less, you know, more in terms of capacity, less in terms of spending on contractors and consultants. And I would expect, and this is a, you know, something that we will uh, detail when we can, but I would expect that that would come up with a saving uh, in the low billions of dollars. Andrew Probin. One of the side benefits of the uh, pandemic, if you want to call it that, is that we've managed to get unemployment into the threes, or we will get it into the threes. Now, obviously, one of the reasons there is that the borders have been closed. What will be your approach to unemployment, given that wages is one of your high priorities? and that uh, having a low unemployment is meant to spark wage increase. When you have got pressures in, say, aged care, that's going to need, as you've just said, tens of thousands of workers. Are you a, a big Australia man, or are you something else? <laughs> well, I, I think, and Christina will, will tell you this too, you know, there's an opportunity uh, as we uh, as the migration settings return to something that looks a bit more like normal, to work out what the best version of that is, what the best mix of that is, uh, temporary, permanent, skilled, unskilled, all of the other uh, types of migration. And so I've always been a supporter uh, of a, um, a decent-sized migration program. Overall, it is good for the economy, but what that requires is that you get the constituent parts of it right uh, and that you build public support for it. And so migration is a big part of the story. On unemployment more broadly, uh, we want the unemployment rate to be as low as possible. And I said in my speech, it's falling in welcome ways, but it's not bringing with it that wages growth that you identify in your question. Uh, it's bringing skill shortages, but it's not bringing wages growth that keeps up with the cost of living, so real wages are falling. And so the difference between our approach to unemployment uh, and the governments, and you'd expect to see this looked at in the white paper if we get the chance to do it, uh, is the labour market is a broader story than just the unemployment rate. Now, the labour market is about underemployment. It's about, it's about concentrated unemployment in communities like the one that I represent, unfortunately. You know, it's about wages. Uh, it's about job security. Uh, and so we take a much broader look uh, at the labour market. Uh, we don't declare victory just because there's a forecast of an unemployment rate, uh, we would declare victory if wages are growing again sustainably in ways that make sure that people can keep up. Uh, if we're dealing with job insecurity, if we're dealing with all of these other issues that have been issues in the labour market for so long. Jade Gelberger. <clears throat> Jade Gelberger from the Herald Sun. The Victorian Labor government says it is being shortchanged under the GST formula with the state now getting 86 cents in the dollar compared to previously 92 cents. Do you think their complaint is fair? Should the system be reviewed? And what changes would you make if you got into government? 
Look, we've said to all of the governments uh, that we don't intend to reopen that deal. That has been a subject of some conjecture. Uh, and as always in these deals, uh, which are uh, done years in advance but are asked to take into account fluctuations in state economies, uh, there are typically you know, people who are happy for good reason and people who are unhappy for good reason. But we don't intend uh, to reopen that deal that's been done. Jonathan Lee. Mr Chalmers, Jonathan Lee from Sky News. Can I ask you um, on two topics, if you don't mind? The first one on childcare and the second one on the stage three of the tax cuts. Uh, Labor traditionally has been a policy of, a party of bold policy. Have you considered uh, universal childcare? We talk constantly about getting families into work and giving children the advantage of education. Is that something you've costed and looked at? And on the stage three tax cuts, do you still support it and are you concerned that it might further drive inflation? Thanks, Jonathan. Uh, on our childcare, what we're proposing gets us closer to that system as you describe it. Uh, not universal, but closer to universal than it would otherwise be because it takes a huge swathe of the workforce uh, and makes it easier and cheaper for them to access childcare. It builds a bigger uh, labour market uh, so, that we can, uh, so that people who want to earn more and work more can do so. Um, we haven't costed or we're not proposing to go the whole way, but what we've proposed goes a substantial way in that direction and I'm proud of it. Um, on uh, stage three, uh, we don't intend to reopen stage three. You know, those tax cuts uh, were legislated through the parliament uh, some time ago. Uh, they come in some time down the track still. Uh, most of the issues that we identify in the economy which are uh, causing these inflationary pressures are on the supply side rather than on the demand side. And that's why we want to lift the speed limit on the economy, training and childcare and energy uh, and all these other issues that I've identified. Thank you. Patrick Commons. Patrick Commons from the Australian newspaper. Uh, your argument that it's about the quality and not the quantity of the spending. Essentially, is that saying that higher spending, if done right, pays for itself through, uh, through the economic dividend that it creates? Or do you accept that COVID's legacy of record debt and deficits means that every budget for the foreseeable future has to be about spending restraint and budget repair? I think there should always be in every budget an element of, of budget restraint. Uh, you know, Pablo asked before about uh, experience that we've had in the past, even in some of those budgets during the global financial crisis that had an element of stimulus, they had an element of trimming elsewhere. And I, I see that, I get asked a lot you know, this first budget that you're talking about, um, you know, will Katie and you sit down and go through spending line by line? And my answer to that is we, we'll do that every budget. Um, and even if the circumstances warrant an expansionary budget at some point, uh, that doesn't mean that you can't um, look for better ways to spend money within the existing budget. It's not a free-for-all. Um, and it won't ever be a free-for-all uh, under us. Um, so that, that task will be important. It will be ongoing. Uh, there will be opportunities for us to improve the quality of the spending, whether the budget is expansionary or not. Shane Wright. Uh, Dr Chalmers, Shane Wright from the SMH and the Age. Your re planned review of the RBA and the intersection with uh, fiscal and monetary policy, would that canvas the bank's charter, um, the inflation target itself, and as we have in some other countries, a target around uh, beyond the size of which a budget deficit may not run, given that you've opened it to fiscal and monetary policy intersection. Yeah. Th thanks, Shane, and thanks for all your, your interesting work on this too for some time. Um, I've tried not to preempt the terms of reference for the review, uh, partly because um, you know, I'd like to sit down with Treasury Secretary, Governor of the Reserve Bank and others. Uh, and, and do that properly. Um, but you can imagine at least a couple of those issues you've raised, if not the last one, uh, that that would be a factor. Obviously, you know, crucial, central uh, to the Reserve Bank's work is the inflation target, obviously. Uh, but there are other aspects of it as well. I'd like to take a pretty broad look, uh, but a constructive look, uh, consulting with Treasury and the bank to make sure that we get those terms of reference right. And so you shouldn't expect uh, you know, detailed terms from us this side of the election before that consultation can appropriately take place. Jared Coburn. 
Uh, thank you for taking my question, Dr Chalmers. Jared Cobra from the Canberra Times. Uh, just to bring your mind to the floods, you're a Queenslander. You've probably experienced flooding more compared to what I have in Canberra. How much concern do you have about the supply constraints given the re in the real uh, sorry in the rebuilding process given there are material shortages globally? Yeah. Are there going to be people in Queensland and northern New South Wales who won't be able to rebuild this year? Yeah, I, I think this is a huge challenge. It doesn't get enough of our attention. You know, even before the floods, you've got uh, difficulty finding tradespeople and you've got very expensive building materials. This was part of the inflation story uh, before the floods, before Russia, Ukraine, before the most recent set uh, of uncertain conditions. And so I think it is realistic to expect that some of the people in my neighbourhood, uh, in northern New South Wales, in southeast Queensland and elsewhere, central coast where Anthony was on the weekend, people will be waiting longer than they would like to rebuild their homes and their lives. Um, and that unfortunately is a consequence of, of not training enough people and not dealing with some of these um, controllable aspects of the inflationary pressures in our economy. So does government um, then need to do more to procure supplies for this rebuild? Yeah, I think there's a role for government in emergencies. You know, you think about AdBlue in the trucking industry, for example, there's a role for government clearly there. The capacity to, to bring the, the country literally to a standstill means that there's a role in emergencies. Um, but there is a limited pool of skills and there's a limited pool of easily accessible building supplies. Uh, and I think that's going to be a big problem in this rebuild. You know, in the, all of the consultations you have with these communities, and we've all been trying to uh, do as much of that as we can, and for me it's not that hard because it's, my community's been impacted. Um, you know, people are having the insurance assessors in and all the rest of it now, and um, their, their expectations need to be managed about how long this is going to take and how much it's going to cost. Now, more broadly, because I see the Prime Minister asked about this in relation to the, the Perrottet government support package and the Morrison government not coming to the table. You know, what this situation requires uh, is a government that's prepared to work with state governments and local councils on some of these really important issues. You know, people have been there for each other during these floods and they need the federal government there for them as well. Uh, there's been limited evidence of that, in my view. Uh, and so we need the three levels of government working together. If there is um, a meaningful difference we can make when it comes to the rebuild, then we should be making it together. No matter what the political persuasion, no matter what federal electorate you live in or what side of the New South Wales-Queensland border, all of that should be irrelevant in the sense that this is going to be a huge challenge in the rebuild and we need a Prime Minister and a federal government willing to work with others to get the job done. We don't have that right now. Lani Scar. Lani Scar from the West Australian. Thank you for your speech, Dr Chalmers. Um, you spoke about your quest to crack down on multinationals and the tax share that they pay. Is this just a con continuation of Labor's theme during the last election campaign to be against the big end of town? And multinational companies obviously employ Australians. Are you concerned if you crack down on them and make them pay more tax, there may not be the jobs there for the Australians who are employed by them? Yeah, I don't see it in any way uh, as a rerun of some of that language that we haven't used for some time. Uh, and I think every time I've been here, this is the fourth time this term, I think every time I've been asked a version uh, of that question, uh, you know, we want to be uh, a pro-business, pro-employer Labor Party because we recognise that the challenges in our economy uh, are so vast uh, and so substantial that you cannot meet them without a working relationship with business, with unions, with the community sector, with the states and others uh, to get the job done. Uh, but there is a global movement here and I pay tribute to President Biden and Secretary Yellen, the OECD under Matthias Cormann and others uh, who say that we've got a challenge here. The, the playing field is not level. That disadvantages local businesses and it disadvantages local communities. Uh, and so we think that there is something measured uh, and responsible that can be done here uh, to fix this situation, to make it fairer. Uh, and that's not um, uh, to diminish uh, or dismiss um, the substantial amount of people who are employed here. And I do, I've done heaps of boardroom conversations as, you, as you'd expect from me the last three years and before that too. Uh, and I think people understand, even the big employers, especially in some cases the big employers, they understand that if there is a global move afoot, Australia should be part of it. David Crow. <clears throat> 
Thank you, Laura. Uh, thanks, Dr Chalmers. David Crowe from The Age of Melbourne and from the Sydney Morning Herald. Uh, you mentioned in your speech multinational tax. We know that that's one area where you intend to raise some revenue. Uh, just a couple on that. Uh, the government in last week's budget did have a revenue raising measure by tightening some of the rules on multinational tax. They gave some money to the tax office to do that. Are you intending to raise more than the government revealed last week or have they stolen your thunder on multinational tax? And just an, an addendum to that question, is there any other revenue raising measure beyond multinational tax that you still have on your policy books? Yep, thanks David. Um, our measures on multinational tax will be uh, beyond what the government proposed in the budget. You know, what the government proposed in the budget was a compliance measure uh, with the tax office, as you rightly identify, uh, and that's something that governments of both political persuasions have done at different times. I don't think that's uh, hotly contested. Uh, our measures on multinational tax would go beyond that. Uh, in terms of uh, other tax measures, uh, I think we've all made it clear, especially in the last couple of days, that we're not going to this election with other proposals on tax beyond multinationals. You know, we've said there might be a conversation with states after the election, uh, but we're going to this election with a proposal on multinationals and nothing beyond that. Uh, now, the issue of um, the, the revenue measures that you identify in the budget raises another important point, though, which I wanted to touch on briefly. Now, Prime Minister Morrison stood up after the budget was released last week and said that there are no revenue increases, no tax increases, no tax measures in the budget, and there never will be. There's $2.1 billion in tax increases in the budget, right? His own budget, Treasurer's budget, $2.1 billion in budget paper to in new taxes and increases in taxes. And so he's lying again about tax. And the other issue is this, and I don't think anyone's ever counted them up, but we counted them up. Uh, we think there's about 150 tax changes made by this government over nine years that weren't taken to an election. Right, 150, right? Tax and revenue and charges, right? 150. About 100 of them are increases to, t to revenue that weren't taken in an election. So let's have a proper, if, if the Prime Minister wants to have this campaign uh, about taxes, let's be honest about it. There are tax increases in the government's budget uh, and they've raised taxes, I think, by our count, about 100 times without taking it to an election. Uh, Dr Chalmers, we're planning to go till about 1.40 if you're happy to keep taking some more questions. Sure. 1.40 today, yeah? <laughs> <laughs> ben Westacott. Uh, thank you, Shadow Treasurer. Ben Westcott from Bloomberg News. Um, you mentioned in your speech factory outputs from China as an example of Australia's vulnerability to global economic uncertainty. Now, there's no doubt that Australia is uh, very dependent on China for its uh, prosperity. In recent years, Australia has faced huge pressure from China in the form of obstacles to Australian exports, wine, meat, coal, things like that. Now, Josh Frydenberg and the government have talked a lot about trade diversification, ramping down Australia's dependence on China. Would that be something that would be continued under a Labor government, uh, and if so, how? Yeah, of course. I mean, I think that's you know, a very important objective that we have diverse markets uh, that our big employers and big exporters are able to access as many uh, advantageous markets as they can. I think that's self-evident. That's bipartisan in lots of ways. Uh, and clearly, as you identify in your question, uh, China has been far more aggressive uh, when it comes to the way it treats our exports, and that has been challenging for us. Um, the issue for us, and we don't seek to make artificial differences between ourselves and the government on the management of that complex relationship, uh, but some of these issues have been a long time in the making. Uh, and, um, you know, ideally, we would have had uh, businesses and employers and exporters uh, able to access other markets uh, before things got so dire. James Riley. Uh, Dr Chalmers, James Riley from Innovation Oz. Thanks for your, uh, your address. Um, my question relates to procurement reform and building uh, sovereign domestic capability. Um, I wonder if you could fill in some more detail on this Made in Australia office that uh, Anthony Albanese's talked about um, and how the process would work by which you would uh, identify specific areas of sovereign need or sovereign capability need. Yeah. Um, and I'd also like draw your attention, I guess, to the $9 billion a year we spend, or the government spends, on uh, IT, um, on information technology, and how that process that you put in place might be applied to that. 
Yeah. Yep, thanks for that. Um, obviously, on that massive spend on IT, we want to make sure we're getting value for money for it. You know, there's not much to say beyond that uh, at this point. Uh, on the uh, Future Made in Australia policy, it's got a number of parts. Uh, local procurement plans are a big part of the story, uh, making sure that our local businesses get a bigger slice of the action when it comes to government procurement, the way that panels work and some of the other issues that you'd be familiar with. Uh, but also a role for co-investment uh, in industries which will be uh, big job creators and big opportunity creators for us for a long time. You know, we've got this National Reconstruction Fund uh, which is all about co-investing in areas where we know that there will be a big opportunity, but where there may need to be some co-investment at the front end to make it work. Uh, you think about you know, the manufacturing of batteries is obviously a big opportunity for Australia given our resources mix and our skills mix and the potential there. You think about hydrogen, some of the other issues in energy. Uh, so there's a number of planks to it, but a future made in Australia for us means getting procurement right specifically and getting the co-investment right. Uh, so that we are not so vulnerable uh, when it comes to these big, long, complex supply chains, uh, the weakness of which has been exposed by the pandemic. John Keogh. Thanks, Mr Chalmers. John Keogh from the Australian Financial Review. Good to hear, like it sounds, uh, you and Kevin Rudd have buried the hatchet now that you're citing his speeches in your pre-election pitch. Um, could I just ask you, though, about the RBA review? Um, why could you just elaborate why it maybe needs to include the interaction with fiscal policy? Um, related to that, do you think the productivity growth assumptions in the budget really need a revisit? Because, as you've pointed out, uh, if we use a more realistic measurement, the debt and deficit is higher. And with the review, should it be conducted by an outsider who's independent of Treasury and the RBA, or something more akin to the Canadian model that Dr Lowe has spoken about, where Treasury and the central bank do it together. Yeah, I am worried about those productivity forecasts. You know, I think uh, for a long time now the government's underperformed against them. Uh, and there's an assumption that all of a sudden, magically, with exactly the same policy mix, uh, that our productivity improvement is going to markedly improve. Uh, and the intergenerational report is based on, I think, uh, a rosier view of productivity than the current policy settings are geared to deliver. So, I, to be frank about it, I am worried about those productivity forecasts. Productivity growth has been disappointing for the best part of a decade, uh, and we need to turn that around. Uh, on the RBA review, again, a bit like um, the answer to Shane's question, um, you know, I'm reluctant to kind of um, indicate what kind of model the review might be without having you know, a, a more than a preliminary discussion with uh, the bank itself and with Treasury. Uh, but I would have thought all of those models should be considered as part of the conversation. You know, my sense of the Reserve Bank, and I'm a supporter of the Reserve Bank, it has had difficult decisions to make, uh, as others have pointed out. Um, I think, you know, it, it is important that we sit down with them and work out uh, the best way to do this review. And part of the respectful way that I want to do that is not to preempt. Uh, the, the models uh, and not to try and draft the terms of reference from opposition. Well, our last question today is from Tim Shaw. Thanks, Laura. Tim Shaw, Jim Chalmers, Director of the National Press Club. A lot of people outside this room, they definitely understand the word tax. They learned a lot about the word excise last week and they understand the Medicare levy. And your leaders talked about uh, Medicare, aged care, and also childcare. Can you rule out in your first and second term as a Labor Treasurer any new excises, any new levies? And just finally, for the beer drinking women and men of Australia, can you announce today the 50% cut in the beer excise? Your leader's <laughs> here, ask him now. Uh, well, the answer to the last one is no. Uh, sorry to the beer drinkers of, of Australia. Men and women. Uh, um, on the other question, I mean, it's the same answer as before. You know, we don't have any, you know, we're not proposing any tax changes beyond multinationals and potentially a conversation with the states. Uh, and, uh, you know, there are lots of different ways to ask that question, but, um, you know, our priority when it comes to repairing the budget, emphasis on quality, maybe mul multinationals, uh, dealing with rorts and waste, you know, those are our priorities. And our priority is growing the economy the right way. Um, and, uh, there are a whole bunch of ideas that get put to us uh, and discussed you know, naturally, appropriately in the public domain, but we're not coming at some of those changes that you've just suggested. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, please thank Dr Chalmers.